now let me address the, the group today. I'm sorry I'm not Cal Ripken, uh, but I have to tell you, first, my heartiest congratulations to all of you graduates. Only you know how hard it really was, how you decided what to do, all the obstacles you overcame, and all the people who helped you along. So it's a wonderful day to give thanks to your families, your friends, the generous people who gave scholarships to many of you, and to the taxpayers of the state of Maryland who have given you a really good school. It's also a day to celebrate the power of ideas, impossible ideas, good ideas, bad ideas, dangerous ideas, right ideas, wrong ideas. We see signs about dangerous ideas on the sides of the Maryland shuttle buses. But to modify what Victor Hugo said, there's nothing so powerful as a bad idea whose time has come. That's one of the greatest challenges of our age, is to tell the difference. If you've been studying history, you've learned about some really bad ideas, like Nazism and emperor worship, and the religious extremism that come from other parts of the world. If you've been studying the news lately, you know we have some of our own homegrown really bad ideas. That's part of what makes politics important and fun. It's also, and always, a day to celebrate the work of the founders of our great nation. On July 4th, every year, I always read the Declaration of Independence to myself, where Thomas Jefferson wrote down some pretty amazing ideas. He gives me goosebumps every time I read it, because what he wrote was not what most people were thinking in 1776. He wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Just that one sentence was worth having a revolution, in my opinion. Well, it did turn out that we had a certain problem later on when we had our constitutional convention and people didn't quite agree yet on what definition we should use for the word men. Some of us were slaves, some of us were women, and of course some of us fought for the other side, the British, and the rest of us called them traitors. We're still working on that project to make sure that we are all treated equally under the law, even just in this country. That's why it's also a day to celebrate Abraham Lincoln's ideas. I've always identified with him, starting with the fact that he was really tall and thin and a bit of an independent thinker. He was an inventor, too, the only president to have a patent. But more important by far, uh, 150 years ago this year, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, so it would no longer be true that one person could own another person. It was a giant step toward full legal equality of all human beings that is still not finished here or in many other countries. When we got to meet the Queen of Sweden at the banquet for the Nobel Prizes in 2006, I asked her what she does. And she spends a lot of her time there trying to protect women from slavery. And I hardly need to mention that if your ideas are different and dangerous, or your skin is a different color from your neighbors, or you have a foreign accent, or a northern accent, or a southern accent, some people will treat you badly. So our work as citizens of the United States and of the world and of guardians of each other is definitely not complete. As a scientist, I also like to remember that in 1863, Abraham Lincoln also signed into law the creation of the National Academy of Sciences to make sure that the government would get good scientific advice. I'm a member now, so I know more about what they do, and I want you to know that they publish a huge variety of reports on practically every technical topic from education to physics to road maintenance and nutrition. You can download them all for free now, so there's no excuse for not knowing what the experts think. Just search for the National Academy of Sciences or the National Academy of Engineering or the Institute of Medicine. So I hope you've all been developing those critical thinking skills that scholars tell us we should learn. And in practical terms, I hope you've learned to be skeptical of great claims, small claims, any claims, when they come from people who stand to benefit from convincing you. I learned about that when I was buying a house. None of the people who are helping you buy a house are going to get paid unless you buy. And then I let a salesman convince me that I should get my house insulated, and I spent a lot of money on something that was pretty useless and probably was a health hazard. So this all means you have to take their claims with a grain of salt, and if you don't, you can buy a lemon. I did that twice, and I'm a little more cautious now. It's the same with figuring out who did it in real-life crimes and detective stories and murder mysteries. Think about qui bono, who benefits. 
that means that all that free information you see on the TV is coming from somebody who is selling a product. It means that all of those political ads are set in selling a product and it's just possible that the people who bought the ads will benefit more than the people who are watching them. It means that behind that free internet access and internet search results, somebody is selling something to make a living and they might not all be telling you the whole truth. So be a little cautious, please, about what you find on the internet. There's no law of nature that says what you find on the internet is always right. The biologists know that for every kind of prey species, there is a predator species. For human beings, we're both predator and prey. So look out. Now I want to talk about failure a little bit. At NASA, we're enormously proud of our accomplishments, and especially of the Apollo moon landing team. President Kennedy said we would go to the moon not because it was easy, but because it was hard and would bring out the best in us. It did. Half a million Americans worked on that project and it changed the way the world looks at us and the way we look at ourselves. It changed the way we do science and engineering projects and it built a technical basis for our leadership of the world. And it gave us the idea, if we can go to the moon, we can, why can't we do anything we want to? Actually, that was a dangerous idea. Sometimes it tempted us into going where we ought not to go. The Apollo program gave us Neil Armstrong, who landed Apollo 11 on the moon with just a few seconds of fuel left in the tanks. And we stepped out onto the surface. He said, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Then when Apollo 11, Apollo 13 was crippled in space, he gave us Gene Krantz, the flight controller in Houston, who said, at least in the movie, failure is not an option and brought the crew home alive. The power of that idea was spectacular. So my approach to life is a little bit like this. Say yes to opportunity. The world is changing very fast, so fast that there's very little you can predict with certainty more than a few years away. When John Kennedy said we were going to the moon, he didn't know how we would do it, but his idea and his commitment made it happen. In a way, that's how you predict the future. You make it happen yourself by saying yes to opportunity or committing yourself to a direction to go. I think there's tremendous power of the idea, but to give it power requires persistence. Persistence to do, persistence to think, persistence to make a plan, persistence to communicate. But there's something else I have to tell you about failure. We had failures in the Apollo program and we learned from them. Failure is part of my history too, and it led directly to me standing here in front of you, though I never thought it would at, at the time. So now I have to tell you a little tiny bit of science. I was in graduate school in Berkeley in 1973 working on a project to measure the cosmic microwave background, which we thought and still think is the heat remaining from the early moments of the universe. Our project was to build a special piece of measurement equipment cooled to a temperature of 1.5 degrees above absolute zero and hang it on a 2,000 foot cable under a giant balloon and send it up 25 miles into the stratosphere. So we built it, my thesis advisor, two other graduate students, a couple of technicians and engineers, and me. But when we launched it in Texas, it went up and up, and it did, just didn't work. There was nothing we could do but go pick it up and fix it and try again. There were some really important lessons here. One was, nature doesn't care whether you think you've done a good job. Either you have or you haven't, and there's only one test that really matters, and that's the real thing. You can't fool Mother Nature. Nature doesn't care either whether we think we're the, oops, we're the uh, cause for Earth getting warmer and the sea level rising and the oceans turning acid because of all the carbon dioxide we're making. Nature doesn't care either if we run out of really important minerals or if we have food shortages or storms or plagues and nature doesn't let you off the hook just because you really believe you were innocent. I'm pretty sure that many of you graduates today are going to be dealing with these questions more and more, and some of you will find wonderful business and science and engineering opportunities in it, but that's a topic for another day. Well, the conclusion I came to at the time of my failure was kind of backwards. I decided this kind of work was way too difficult, and I found a place to work where I could try something else to become a radio astronomer and build an instrument to observe molecules in space. I started work at a small NASA laboratory in New York City, right upstairs from Tom's restaurant on Broadway, and at the beginning of 1974, and I thought I was going to be done with this cosmic background radiation. Well, I didn't know about it, but NASA was getting ready to ask for new satellite missions. It was just five years after the Apollo 11 landed on the moon, and the moon missions were over. 
I told my advisor that my thesis project had failed, but it should have been done in outer space. So we put together a team and wrote a small proposal, and 15 years later, idea was, there's that idea again, that word again, was launched into space, and it started measuring the heat of the cosmos, and this time it worked. It worked for a lot of reasons. The most important one was that NASA has a system to make it work, and we have the backing of the American people. We have a team of professional leaders, engineers, who have really learned to be skeptical, just as I was trying to urge you to be. They know that if you don't test something, it will not work. They know it in their bones. They know that Murphy's Law is right, and they know that if it's not broken, don't fix it. They know that better is the enemy of good enough, as Voltaire told us in 1772, was something I might not have really known myself if my thesis project hadn't failed. We are very organized about our test programs. We write down everything that could go wrong, and then we make sure that none of those things can happen. We have to do this because, by nature, scientists and engineers are congenital optimists, and they, that can get us into trouble if we don't have a system. Of course, there's no such thing as being sure a thing will work, but there is such a thing as being thorough and doing the best you can with what you have, and there is such a thing as saying you're ready to launch um, your mission because it's not good enough yet. We did have to do that. So our little mission did what we said it would do, and then some. First, we confirmed that the expanding universe really is expanding because the heat we measured matched exactly with the predictions. Second, we found that the early universe wasn't exactly uniform, but had lumps in it. Stephen Hawking said that was the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. What he meant was, I think, that if we hadn't found those spots, we would have no clue how we could come to exist in the expanding universe. Now two more satellites have been flown to follow up our discovery, and we have pushed the mystery of our existence a little farther away. That's why I got a call from Stockholm in 2006, and I got to meet the king and queen of Sweden. If you want to know a lot more about it, go to NobelPrize.org, and you can learn about all the prizes back to 1901. But this brings me back to the topic of failure. I wouldn't have been in Sweden if my thesis project hadn't failed. I wouldn't have been in Sweden if our satellite hadn't failed its test on the ground so we could fix it before we launched it. So I want you to think about whether a failure is really a failure or not, and why you would call it a failure. I think if you're too afraid of failure, you can't get started. You can't put your heart into something because you're always thinking about yourself and your survival instead of your objectives and your purpose. So you can't take yourself too seriously, just take your choices and your life seriously, and then have a bit of a laugh about it, about how serious it all seems, and then you can get somewhere. So I think, as so many people have said, nothing ventured, nothing gained, and you have, but you have no way of knowing how far you can get once you start off. When we wrote our first satellite proposal, I really didn't think it would work, but I was sure it was worth a shot, because if we were chosen, we would be able to some, discover something of tremendous importance that would change science forever. When we were working on the proposal, we didn't stop to say, let's not propose it because it might not work. We just got going. There's also a huge element of luck in a great success, and there's a huge element of determination and focus, and after you succeed, you can look back at all the people and the systems who helped you along. For myself, I can never thank my friends and colleagues enough for making sure our satellite would work out. I can never thank the American citizens enough for, finding, for building, funding our work. The citizens of the United States earned those Nobel Prizes that were given to Americans by supporting their work and by making the United States a good place to live so that really smart people come here to work and pursue their dreams. People sometimes say I'm a very humble guy because I'm so thankful and appreciative. That's not quite right. I'm actually very proud of what I did and what we did together and grateful that we had the support so we could succeed. For you graduating here today, I think it's also a great time to be thankful and humble and proud all at the same time. Congratulations and may the force be with you.